Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Pockotter, and you're listening to Call Talk for August 8, 2018. Today's topic is the power of an effective feedback loop. If you are listening live, we invite you to be part of the show and ask questions. Here's how you do that. Email me at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com. I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to at BenchmarkPortal.com any time of the day. And now I would like to introduce the host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you, Alan, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. Well, you know, feedback is the source of information pearls, really the kind of pearls you can use to find problems, uh, get and get better going forward, which is really the essence of good contact center management. And that's why we wanted to talk more about feedback loops, and we brought in an expert on the topic for you, Dan Handy, the president of Visual Q. Welcome to the show, Dan. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, great. Well, by way of introduction, uh, Dan has spent his career merging the technology and business worlds together. In the mid-90s, Dan was a co-founder of Free Servers, which was a free web, serving, web hosting site, and he led the division through a turnaround after the economic downturn of 2001. Uh, he joined Bluehost as the chief operating officer in 2005 and helped grow that company to 225 employees before selling it. And from 2010 to 2014, Dan took over as general manager and CEO of the Bluehost Brands, growing the division to 700 employees and operating at a 48% margin. That's great. Uh, Dan's a partner in Peak Capital and Peak Ventures, and as I mentioned before, he is currently the president of Visual Q. So, Dan, uh, just to kick things off, your your story is fascinating. Uh, you ran a large hosting company that had some unique dynamics uh, that you know would make it essential to find every efficiency possible. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you learned about feedback loops in in that process? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it would be great. And, and, you know, interestingly enough, too, I didn't put that on my background, but my original first technology job was as a clipper programmer for a BPO. Um, So I I got started early in the the contact center industry. And uh, so there at Bluehost, yes, we – we uh, were a large web hosting company at the height uh, uh, before I left there. Uh, we had about um, 3 million websites that we were hosting uh, hosted and had about 1.3 million customers. And the average revenue per customer was only about $11 per month. And we had made a conscious decision at Bluehost, too, that we wanted to make sure that we had high-quality technical support, that that would be one of our differentiators. So in order to do that, we hired all local U.S. people, and we decided to not outsource our support to, to uh, other countries. That, uh, and so that meant our level one tech support agents made uh, $15 an hour, plus benefits, plus rent, and all the other things that go into it. So a fully burdened agent was quite expensive to us. So you can imagine with only $11 uh, average revenue per month uh, and and our agents costing us, um, you know, upwards of $40,000 maybe around a fully burdened agent, then, of course, efficiency had to be at the heart of everything that we did. And so we had built a culture of efficiency there to try to uh, be profitable, and we were able to be very successful with that, but it, it, it wasn't easy. Mm. No, it sounds like it would be an uphill b- battle, uh, you know, considering those challenges. How were you able to get to uh, 50% pro- profitability in the organization and uh, how did how did uh, feedback loops help you do that? Yeah, so of course you can't do that without just having. We had to have a culture of efficiency throughout the entire organization. We did many things in terms of automation to help out with that. Um, but a, a key part of that was the feedback loops, and uh, and that's what uh, you know today's show is about to talk about that and how you can implement that. And so uh, I want to talk about. 
we we were able to stumble upon a lot of principles that later we figured out uh, and and got really good at. And uh, you know, there's a, there's an article that is on um, on Wired from an author called T- Thomas Goats, and he he talked about the different stages of a, an effective feedback loop. And I thought that he explained it really well about the important principles that you need to have to be able to create that effective uh, feedback loop. So let's just run through those four stages real quick, and and then uh, we could talk about how you implement it um, and get it throughout your organization. But So the first step or uh, stage of an effective feedback loop is the evidence stage. So in the evidence stage mean by aggregation organization and dissemination of data so of course you can't you can't you know get uh, have a proper feedback loop without data being measured and things being measured and uh, inside of that it's really important that you measure the right things that you determine what are the PIs that uh, are that we need to be able to uh, measure to be able to drive performance for people and and what are the things, uh, how can we get that data? It's also super important in this stage that you make sure that you've got data integrity, that nothing is worse than having bad data, right? Uh, and, and then uh, if you start disseminating that bad data, then people lose trust in the data. So first off, make sure that you're getting your uh, tools right now. Bluehost, what we had to do... Uh, Back in those days, then I um, used uh, some programming resources to be able to pull the data straight from the switch, straight from the CRM and other places to be able to aggregate uh, all of the data together and be able to share that and disseminate that throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. So we would actually uh, send out a daily email that uh, showed everyone's uh, performance grouped together by team so that everybody could see uh, where they st- stand within their team. And, and we thought, felt it was me- important to measure um, uh, within teams because teams have different functions, right? And right. that kind of leads in, into the second stage, like the relevant stage. So you got to make sure that the data that you're measuring is relevant to the people that are being measured, right? Now, we're, we're talking specifically here about agents because, you know, that, that was the bulk of, of our employees. Um, and in many, uh, in, in your contact center, that's the bulk. But really, a feedback loop can apply to uh, any type of position, programmers, IT people, whatever, right? It's, uh, the principles are the same. So you need to make sure, first, you grab the 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 data the, in the evidence stage. The second stage is with the relevance. So now I've got to make sure that the data that I am measuring and presenting to the person is relevant to that person. Now, this is something that cannot sometimes get overlooked or uh, not done properly. It's really important that you make, in making that data relevant, that it, they feel like what they're being measured against is all data that they can affect, right? So you don't want to measure somebody against something that they can't control. Everything needs to be within their control. So like, for example, a frontline agent can control um, a number of calls that they're taking or uh, time spent in after call work or uh, their schedule adherence. There's things that they can control that is completely within their control, but there's other things that wouldn't be within their control. So making sure that it's relevant to them, um, that's a really yeah. critical part. Yeah. So no, I, I think that's, to, that's something that yeah, uh, really needs to be underlined. I think, that Dan, that's an excellent point. It really needs to be underlined that when we're talking about uh, you know data, it, it needs to be something that is uh, actionable by the person, which means it's under their control. Yes. Because otherwise, it's uh, data that uh, goes on the shelf or is good for somebody else, but that you really don't have any impact on. So uh, right. understanding that is is absolutely key. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Dan, I mean, please go or ahead. Or also, it can be 
it can also be really frustrating to somebody if if it's seen as a company goal, but they don't have any tie or control to that. You know that it's not something that that they can affect. So it's really important that it can affect it. So third stage is the consequence stage. So as this information is being measured, it's relevant to then the, the uh, individual person that there there obviously that there needs to be built in. Uh, consequences or that it drives towards action right and so now those consequences don't necessarily have to be something negative or bad um, but it, and that with those in that um, consequence stage though you is the information is available and visible to all then they can take action to be able to um, to to change that and so with the information in that stage, too, it's important that people have a sense of what they can do and what opportunities they have to act on, on that. So also, um, as, as supervisors or managers are aware of the performance and being measured and everything, then they can help uh, shepherd through that process uh, the, the, the potential consequences. So the consequences may be, hey, I'm having a hard time with long calls, so I I need some training or some help on how do I shorten my calls a little bit so that I can um, be more effective, or yep. whatever that that part is, right? So that's the part of being able to consequence, not consequence in terms of hey you're fired, like those are yep. obvious consequences, but consequences in terms of leading towards a- improvement. So it's sort of like the therefore. It's sort of like the therefore. You yes. know, once you've understood things from the uh, the second stage, uh, what is the therefore? What 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 then happens in order to make things better or to uh, press the advantage, whatever it happens to be? I gotcha. Yep. That that's right. And then the last stage, which leads right into that, is the action stage. So okay, now now uh, I've measured it. I see how it's relevant to me. I see the therefore is a great way to put it is in the consequence stage. And so now the last is, okay, so what exactly do I need to do? Um, and so if you're measuring all of those things properly and you're giving them feedback and context and the, uh, and the supervisors also are uh, aware of all of that, then you can create specific action plans to be able to help people improve their performance to be able to move towards the purpose of whatever the goal of the organization or the individual is. So that entire uh, feedback loop to be able to um, help the uh, person be aware of their behavior and and um, and adjust their behavior towards uh, the company goals and expectations. No, that's great, great information, Dan. And I just wanted to tell our listeners that the uh, article that Dan was referring to is by Thomas Goetz, and the last name there is spelled G-O-E-T-Z. Uh, and it's something he yeah. wrote for the website Wired. So feel free to look that up and uh, soak that in for yourself. And as you were talking, Dan, it occurred to me that uh, right now I happen to be completing an on-demand course for workforce management. And it also has the same kinds of stages that are so important. Uh, so, for instance, we call the gathering stage would be the evidence stage. Yep. And making sure that you, you know, gather the data, making sure that data is good data because, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out certainly uh, is something that can have an, a huge impact here. And uh, then, you know, the second stage is relevance and where you actually say, okay, what do I do with this data? And what, who is it relevant for? And that kind of is a little bit like the forecasting stage, just to make it uh, maybe more relevant to some of our listeners. Uh, and where you actually you know, do something with it that's uh, going to be important, which is trying to figure out what the future is. And then your third stage is consequence, you know, the therefore, which is sort of like scheduling in uh, workforce management. And you turn, it, you turn the useful information that you got from the previous stage, right? In your case, the relevant stage or in the workforce management stage, the uh, forecasting stage, into uh, actionable data, right? And that's the consequence, the therefore, right? And then you can take the action, which is the last stage that you were talking about. And yep. in the case of uh, workforce management, you know, you go from the scheduling, uh, which would be like the consequence stage to the real-time optimization stage, 
where you're just making sure that the whole thing is, is working. So, uh, yeah, I think that uh, the the way you've broken this out is extremely, uh, you know, interesting. And, and um, you know, what impact have you seen in your work now when a proper feedback loop is deployed? And, and if you can give us some details, too, on what kind of metrics, what kind of things you've actually uh, put into your feedback loops, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. So, so it actually makes a huge difference. You know, I, I liken the the uh, feedback loop uh, analogy to sort of like collecting spare change. You know, uh, back uh, when my kids were smaller, we we collected a bunch of change into a, a jar, and then yep. uh, you know we took it to the store and dumped in the the change. And I'm thinking, ah probably a hundred bucks in there and out popped like 700 bucks. And I'm like, Whoa, how could it, how could it be that much? That's pretty crazy. And, uh, but that's, that's really what you're trying to do in your contact center. When you have a proper feedback loop and everybody's aware and they're responding quickly, then it, Oh, I saved a little 30 seconds on that call. Oh, I saved a couple of minutes here in this after call work. Oh, I was available five more minutes. And then all of a sudden your utilization starts to creep up from 50% to 55% to 60 or percent or higher. And with that utilization, then there's tons of cost savings. And so it, it's like collecting all that change, um, you know, but there were, there were rare things that we did at Bluehost that made individual things that made the, this huge, massive I, 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 uh, impact, but all the little things and all the little feedback things and trying to get people to take individual accountability for their own performance is really what made the difference. Um, I have a really good friend that ran a BPO, and he said, you know, I, I noticed that, that I had huge performance differences in my teams based on their supervisor. And so he said, I kind of ran things like a mini P&L for each supervisor in their team and, to try to see things. And, and I told him, I said, well, yeah, but wouldn't it be better if, you had all of your people taking individual accountability for their own performance. And that was the goal that we tried to do uh, by creating these feedback loops. And, and I, I'd like to share just three other principles with you. We talked about the four stages of the feedback loop. And let me give you three principles to then implement effectively this feedback loop. Because if you don't have it, you won't, it, we won't, you won't be successful. So uh, Please do. let me just, yeah, yeah, let's let's go over those real quick. So the first one is expectations, okay? So if you want people to have individual accountability and self-governance to where they're taking responsibility over their por for own performance and you're not waiting for a supervisor to go, you know, beat them over to the head and say, hey, what's going on? How come your performance is poor? It starts with expectations. So an agent must clearly understand what, what is expected of me every day. What does good look like? What in, in terms of, we talked about the feedback loop and measuring. So what are those things that are being measured? When they're measured, they need to understand against those measurements, what does good look like in terms of mm -hmm. number of calls, average handle time, uh, after call work, all of those things. They need to clearly understand what does good look like, and it needs to be constantly reinforced because somehow, as humans, we seem to forget. <laughs> and, and so being able to reinforce in their minds, these are the expectations. This is what we expect. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and if I could just uh, add something in there, yep. Dan, I think that is so key that people understand what is expected of them. And the, the ways that that can be brought across to people are a number of ways. One is... Uh, the basic things should be in your mission statement, right? And there's just tons yep. of call centers that still don't have a mission statement. And so one of the things that I encourage them to do is to, to make a mission statement that is in keeping with their corporate mission statement <clears throat> so that they're supporting the corporate mission and then actually put it on the wall so that, yep. uh, you know, when you're talking about expectations, these are the first expectations is that everything is in line with that. And then you can have goals that go with it, which I think are very compatible with what you're talking about. And those goals yes. can also be stated and written down and put on the wall. And uh, yep. that way, you know, people will know. And because and it is so important, uh, if I could just tell a quick story, um, 
that I've told before, but anyway, one of my former colleagues um, was put in charge of one of the AT&T uh, centers back in the 1990s. And uh, she uh, inherited a center, which was one of their 23, I think it was, centers. And she, hers was third from the bottom and in terms of performance metrics. And a year later, her center was third from the top. And I said yeah. to her, how did you manage to do that? And she said, Bruce, I let everyone know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He said nobody had ever told them before what they were being measured on, how they were doing, and all that sort of thing. I let everybody know. And what you're saying yeah. is then the expectations were clear. Uh, they talked through so that everybody understood. And at the yeah. time, they didn't have an ability to, uh, to technologically sort of bring it down to the individual level. But today you do. So, I mean, uh, all those things yeah. that you were saying certainly are uh, implementable these days. Yeah, it's. Uh, I have a, a, st- a similar story too. I went um, uh, a couple of years ago. I went and was helping a, a portfolio company that was growing crazy fast. From uh, they grew from 20 employees to 200 employees in a year and a half. And um, when I went over to to help them out um, and was looking in their support department. And um, and I noticed that uh, the response time over chat was like two hours uh, on average, and I'm like, this is unacceptable. Did you guys know this was <laughs> this, is, this was going on? And and all I did was go over to the, the the support group, pulled them together, said, guys, help me understand. What are our processes here? What, what is the expectation? What what should a customer, if you were a customer, you know, what would be an expected wait time and everything? So we talked about that, and I said, well, what goal can we have in the short term uh, to be able to fix this? And 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 uh, I said, well, let's let's see if we can get down to five minute response times. So without changing, I just reiterated the goal every morning. Went over there and said, how are we doing? Remember, we want to be under five minutes, like response times to the customers. In three days, we went from two-hour response times to five-minute response times. Then we said, okay, five minutes is nice, but that's not good enough. What about under a minute? Well, three days later, we were under a minute um, response times. We didn't change the staff. We did, the only thing we did was change expectations of like what's acceptable, what's good, and what does good look like. So a uh, similar story in, in, in the power of expectations. A fun exercise would be, Go talk to your, you know, talk to your management level and say, hey, what does good look like for our agents and what should our expectations be and what should our service levels be? And then go all the way down the chain, down to pull a few individual frontline agents off, you know, in your office and ask them, what does good look like for your position? How do you know you're doing a good job on a daily basis and what are we expecting out of you? And see what kind of answers you get. (laughs) Yeah, It would be very telling. Oh, it's great that the, the management by wa- walking around and talking to people that way and finding out what the response is, that's, that's wonderful. And uh, that story about getting chat down from two hours to five minutes to one minute, I want to write a case study on that, Dan. That just sounds really good, uh, you know, yeah. both for, for the results, but also how you got the results. I mean, that's really the, uh, the fascinating part yeah. and the instructive part there. That's really great. Um, yeah. you know, and, and you can't always do that because sometimes it's also a function of volume and other things. And, and, and you know, people work a, l- a little more hours and we, we found ways to just make it more efficient. But but the point is that the, the biggest problem there was just there were no expectations, you know. So people were kind of answering and they were kind of jumping, hopping between different duties and stuff. So just aligning is say, no, no, we got to give the customers this kind of service levels then it really helped fix that. So, yeah, um, no, that's great. So, so, uh, so that's this is another great example of the feedback loop. So, number one principle in uh, implementing this four-staged if, uh, effective feedback loop is expectation. They need to know what what is expected out of them. Number two principle in terms of creating individual accountability. And what's what's great is that with this this small support team, like that in this latest example that I'm giving you, what's great is that people love to take 
accountability. They they were they were coming back to me every day. Hey, we had another idea. If we did this or we if we tweak this thing over here, or whatever, like we think we can answer people faster or we could see the issues quicker. And so um, now the second principle is awareness and measurement. So we talked about measurement in the in the um, feedback loop stage. Well, now you've got to make sure that, it, and we talked about the, getting the information to them, that's this awareness stage. So they need to understand and they need to see, oh, well, this is what happened yesterday. Hey, good job, guys. We went from two hours the day before to 20 minutes. That's great. So that's an improvement. Now let's keep going. So the awareness part, it needs to be visible to the individual agent and, like we talked about, relevant to them, the things that they can affect, right? And then the last piece of this, the third principle that is ultra critical, that measurement and awareness needs to be transparent throughout the organization so that other people can see it and they know that it's not just visible to them, but it's visible to everyone else. Um, and that, and so the, the, it helps create that accountability. I have a really great example that all of us have, are familiar with that, that could show you the power of this exact, uh, these three principles. I'm sure all of you have been, you know, driven down a street where they have the speed limit sign and underneath the speed limit sign or on a little stand next to it, they have a radar that shows you your speed, right? Yep. Um, oh, yes. You've seen those before, right? Oh, so, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> So that is these exact three principles, okay? So they, the speed limit sign, sign itself sets the expectation, right? And in case it was unclear, we've all driven down a road where we're like, gosh, I'm really not sure what the speed limit is on this road. Well, now speed limit sign tells me 25 miles per hour. It's clear, ultra clear. I know the expectation. Okay, now I've got measurement of my speed. And I'm seeing it right on that screen. So in case I wasn't looking down at my dashboard on my car and know how fast I'm going, I'm seeing it right in my face right now. Oh, I'm going 45 in, <laughs> in 25, right? And then the third piece of that is I know everybody else around there can see that I'm going 45 in that 25 also, right? Now, the interesting thing about those speed limit things, did you know I looked up a study, they show that people will slow down with those radar things up to 80% of the time. It affects behavior 80% of the time. And everybody knows that from those speed limit signs, you don't get a ticket. Everybody knows you won't get a ticket, right? So it's not like there's some huge negative consequence, so I got to slam on the brakes. It's only awareness and accountability. It's just showing everybody that hey, this is your speed. This is the again. This is your performance against the expectation, and everybody can see it. And that alone uh, improves performance by eighty percent. That's fabulous. I mean, conceptually, it's all very clear. And in terms of uh, the tools, you know, having scorecards uh, that are the metrics for the loop, uh, having the processes for it, uh, very very important. Well, we're. Uh, we're starting to get toward the end of the hour, so I'd like to uh, ask Alan if he's got any questions for Dan uh, from the audience. Yes, we got a couple questions here. <clears throat> the first question is from Jen. How were you able to get the necessary data to get relevant information to your agent? Yeah, so that's that's an awesome question, and uh, that can be tricky, you know, especially when you don't have great programming resources like uh, at the different organizations that I've worked at, and in particular in Bluehost, we had to spend a lot of time and effort in terms of uh, making sure that we were pulling the data. Now, we, we would primarily pull, so that it depends on what you're measuring, but obviously if you're talking about frontline agents, you're going to have to get things out of your switch. So now you your phone switch or your um uh, automated dialer to be able to pull, you know, average call time, number of calls, and all of those kinds of things. You can get all of that information out of there. If you've got a switch that's in the cloud, they might have an API that you can pull from, or you can look at log files um, if they're there, or on-premise switches uh, tend to have sometimes uh, ways to be able to access the data out of there, too. And then usually you've got data, maybe about sales data that's important, 
or other important data that might come out of your CRM and being able to pull the data out of there. But you're going to need some IT help. You're going to need, uh, you know, somebody to be able to pull that data out and aggregate it into one place that then you can disseminate that data from. Uh, so it can be a little bit tricky, and it, it requires some technical resources, but that's uh, a place that you can get started. And, you know, one of the things that uh, our experience has shown is that uh, getting these reports, getting these dashboards together, et cetera, uh, are definitely worth it, can have very high ROI, particularly when the information is used the way that you've been talking about, Dan, which is to create expectations, awareness, and the transparency. So uh, very, very uh, good points there. And in addition to the ACD, if one of the things that you're trying to um, make sure that is watched is adherence, then, of course, you need to have a workforce management system because yep. that's the only way you're going to get your adherence. So knowing where all that information is from and the best way to put it together so that it becomes a useful feedback loop is, uh, is key to all this. Okay, great. Yes. Uh, Alan? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have more to say on that, Dan? No, no, but I totally agree with you. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Alan, I think we've got right. time for one or two more. Yeah, we got a couple more questions left. Uh, the next one is from Peter. He said, you mentioned that effective feedback loop can contribute to lowering attrition. Why do you think that is? Yeah, so this is something that is extremely uh, interesting. So primarily when you talk about the feedback loops, we're talking about increasing efficiencies and everything, but it also can really help in lowering attrition. And that is, um, you know, there's lots of studies that show why people quit their jobs. And, and one of, one of, you know, one huge reason is, is their direct boss or person that's over them. But one of the primary drivers of why a person leaves their job is back to that thing that we talked about expectations, that they don't understand what the expectations are and they don't understand how to succeed in their job. So they feel frustrated. They don't feel like they can't succeed. And so every day is just like horrible for them feeling like, uh, man, I'm either a failure. I just don't know how to succeed in my job. And so they give up and move on to something else. So when you create that effective feedback loop and we go back to what we talked about, the principles of expectation, and then we talked about the stages of helping to be able to figure out when you've got that data, the supervisors can work with their people and they can say, hey, look, I can see here where if we improve this part of your performance, then you're going to be doing great for us. And you can give them specific feedback instead of just saying, hey, you're not taking enough calls or, you know, or, hey, you're just your utilization isn't good enough. Well, help them figure out why it isn't good enough set that expectation and help them figure out how to succeed. And you're actually, your attrition will go uh, down significantly uh, because, because people feel like they can su succeed. They, they know what you expect you and you help them get there. So it actually can make a huge difference in uh, attrition. Yeah. You know, one of the things, if I could add this, we did a uh, study of over 5,000 agents uh, in North America, and the results were really very, very interesting in terms of uh, what the satisfiers and dissatisfiers are for agents. And uh, coming at the bottom of the heap in terms of uh, areas uh, that they are not satisfied with uh, included communication, work schedule, uh, work recognition, and value slash appreciation. And the communication yeah. and the value slash appreciation are really spot on for what you've been talking about, Dan. Exactly. Um, and I, I think there can be a lot of, uh, you know, people who could take the advice that you're giving and, uh, you know, improve their uh, morale and also the, uh, the the retention that they have in their center. So that's great. Well, let's see. I think we can maybe do one more quick one. Alan, do you have one more? Yeah, I can pull a quick one up. We have one from Tim. And he says, what if you do not have a team of developers to help collect appropriate and accurate data? Mm. Yes, yeah, so, so that, can be, that can be tough when you don't have the technical resources to be able to do it. Um, so a, a few things on that. One, one is sometimes there are 
consulting groups or other places where they can help pull that data for you and they can help um, be able to get that information for you and aggregate it. There are multiple places like that. Um, nowadays, too, there are more and more software um, that that will plug into your switch, uh, your ACD or your phone switch, or will plug into uh, your CRM or different things. So you, you can definitely look around for apps and uh, add-on apps that you can add that would easily give you some of this data and b make it more visible. And there are dashboarding apps and other things that can aggregate that data together to really help you out. So. Um, depending on what technology stack you have and what you're using, there are things that are can work almost out of the box, and there's also people that you can consult with that maybe have done this and and can pull it for you and set it all up. Uh, but it, it is a challenge without any uh, without much technical resources. Yep. No, I would agree with everything that you said on that one, Dan. So, okay. Well, unfortunately, because this has been a great uh, episode. We're at the end of our time. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dan Handy of uh, Visual Q, we really appreciate your uh, having joined us. Are there any final words that you'd like to leave with us before we uh, hand things over to Alan to say goodbye? I really appreciate you uh, ha having me on. I, just, I love talking about these things. Uh, it's a lot of fun to try to grow businesses and the challenges and difficulties that are involved with that. And so wish everybody the best of luck in implementing some feedback loops. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Great, great session. And uh, now over to you, Alan, to wrap things up. Thanks again to Dan and Bruce Belfiore for your insightful discussion on today's show. Be sure to join us next month for another great show or look at our huge selection of archived shows and topics at benchmarkportal.com. Then click on Call Talk, where you'll find over eight seasons of this show. From all of us here at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. This is Alan Pockhotter signing out. Have a great day.